Robert Kuntz. Today, I'm happy to present to you this interview with Gary Bickett. Uh, Gary Bickett is a friend of mine whose uh, background is Scottish and who currently lives in the United States. He spent many years studying Chinese traditional martial arts and Qigong in mainland China at the Beijing Sports University in the 1990s and early 2000s. Gary also has extensive experience working together with the NHA, the National Health Service of the United Kingdom, uh, as well as similar organizations in the United States to promote and disseminate Qigong culture uh, as a type of uh, secondary healthcare practice, which can assist patients in the recovery process, as well as prevent or uh, slow down some of the negative side effects of aging. So Gary is a very interesting person to talk to about uh, both uh, Qigong and Chinese martial arts. Um, um, Gary was an exceptionally uh, good interviewee, and we had a really nice time talking. Um, he runs a YouTube channel that you can check out to see his Qigong and martial arts practice and also learn from him. Um, and uh, he's one of the uh, very special members of the internal arts community uh, who's capable of making a, a great com contribution uh, and who you should definitely check out. So without any further ado, I present this interview with Gary Bickett. Thank you very much. That's uh, I'm, My head's not going to fit out the door at the end of that there. <laughs> yeah, it's well, good. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, I was just saying, it's, it's finally good to, to have a face-to-face -face chat with you. We've been uh, bumping on Facebook for, I think, since the first days of the the, the Sing Yi group. Um, and then I think I was I was in Japan when you were in China, and then I went over to China, and you were actually in Japan. You're like, hey, are you here? And I was like, no, I'm in China, and you were in Japan. It's like, oh. <laughs> oh, that's not so. I like your shirt, by the way. Oh, so this, I have to, shameless promotion. This is my oldest artwork. That's nice. And, and uh, he had a, a project where he was to draw a tiger at school, and everyone in the class had to draw a tiger. And uh, the, the, the goal was to see all the different styles, who would come out with, like, the ferocious tiger or the cute tiger. And it was a really cool sort of, there was a, a different level to just the art skill. And he drew this tiger and I was like, that's, that's a Sing Yi tiger if ever there was. And he started to train with me and he loves the concept of the 12 animals. So he's, he's slowly working his way through an art piece of each of the animals. But this is his tiger. Oh, and that is cool. I, I, I was like, that's, that's good enough to put on a t-shirt. <laughs> so I did. Which is oh, a, you're a, lucky to have talented children. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I have three, and uh, the oldest, as I say, the the other two, not so much ready yet for the martial arts, but the oldest is starting to to get into that way of thinking and and seeing value in it. So, oh, brilliant! I I love it. So now, um, you're from the UK, but you live in the United States. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So I'm from Scotland originally, um, but like left there not too long ago but I bounced around for a wee while and then managed to to settle in the states 13 years ago so currently in Rhode Island in the the northeast brilliant you like it it's good yeah it's good I mean if I didn't I wouldn't be here I suppose um like one one of the greatest things we have is this free will it's the <laughs> the choice to move on if you if you don't like where you are but it's been it's been good um there's there's always pros and cons with in terms of the martial arts community there's there's the well established almost like factory production schools and then there's the schools that are teaching traditional and it it's it's always a fight for who gets the students um but there's a lot of opportunity here which i don't think there always is in other places um because most people nowadays with access to the internet they can do their research and find out but there's there's enough of a population to try and get hopefully cater for everyone, for everyone wants to, to study. Nice. So now what we've done here is we've established that you are a martial arts teacher. So before we get too deeply into that, can we have a little bit of your resume so that we know what you've been up to and who you are, a little bit about where you've been? Because you also mentioned that you were in Asia. And yes. so I'm really interested to hear more about the background. Yeah, yeah. So I think... Show, show my age a wee bit but I think I got the start that a lot of people got in the, the 70s because I grew up in in 70s Scotland and it was in a small town so there really wasn't there wasn't choices um but on on TV and this possibly a wee bit before your time Robbie 
there was the the old Japanese series. They did a, a version of the Water Margin, the the Legend of of the Water Margin, and it blew my mind as a kid to see all these different fighters who had a different style. Because up to then, it was you know you watched maybe boxing on the telly and that was it. Um, but there was no kung fu. There was no Chinese martial arts anywhere to be found at that point where I was living. Anyway, it was again small town, uh, northeast of Scotland. Um, but what was available was judo. And I started judo in 1979 and uh, enjoyed it to a degree, but it wasn't it wasn't what my goal was at that point. But I still trained it because it was all that was there. And then I shifted about maybe a year and a half later to Shotokan karate, because, again, that was that was also available. So you had the choice of judo or, or Shotokan basically at that time. And uh, I stuck that out. But again, trained it, got the basics. But it wasn't in my head what I, I, I was really wanting. And then total roll of the dice. And this is this is part of the geography of it. I grew up in a town that was close to a, a Royal Air Force base. And uh, my original Kung Fu teacher got posted there. And I think it was about early 1980s. And he started a class, a Kung Fu class in my town in 1983. And uh Shout out to Gordon Faulkner. That was Gordon that started that class. A phenomenal teacher um, and still training and teaching today. And, and it was like, that was it. So I I, I, sh I left the judo, left the shotgun and went to, to just, it was sort of what you would just call old school Kung Fu. Because for those that know and, and treat Kung Fu as, well, it's anyone can have Kung Fu, like a shoemaker can have Kung Fu because it means like that acquired skill. Um, but this was kind of like, you know, it was, it was more of a bridge towards what I was was looking to do. Um, so we started then and we started with a lot of the basics. It was my first real introduction to Chin Na, which was phenomenal for me because the judo had some great grappling, but the Chin Na brought it much smaller circle, which uh, for me was was more what I was looking for. Um, that was also my first introduction to Qi Gong. And we just, we basically were working with um, just Jan Zhuang at that point, standing Qigong, postural uh, Qigong. Uh, so I studied that for a good few years, just sticking with just those little aspects. And then once I got a little older, I think 14 or 15, then Gordon at that point started introducing some of the older students to Sing Yi and Tai Chi. And um, so then I picked up Sing Yi in, I think, 88, 1988. And that, that, that was one of those love at first sight situations once I learned what the concepts were. Um, very little like outside influences in terms of media. There was very little books at that time. There was no video I had seen at that time, but um, we were learning through it. And there was an early book called The Way of Harmony, which just sort of, it gave a very brief introduction to Qigong, Tai Chi, Sing Yi and Bagua. And I got that one. I was like, all right, well, let's see how far we can go with this one specifically. So that's really been my one consistent style that uh, I've stuck to. I, do, I still practice, obviously, and learn the other ones, but that was it. Um, and then, my goodness, from then, I, I branched out the Qigong a wee bit and started studying. There was um, the Healing Tao system through Mantak Chia. So one of his top students, Huan Li, came over to the, the UK. And again, this is geography. I grew up very close to a, a commune that was set up in the, the late 60s. It was an old hippie commune, but they would bring in amazing, like esoteric instructors for meditation, for Qigong, for oh, a, a broad range of different things. And Huan Li was uh, one of the, the he, he was, he, if you're ever, are you familiar with Man Tai Chi's books? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, so in the books, there's all these amazing illustrations in the books. Huan Lee was the artist that did the illustrations. Oh, way. He, was wow, also, he was also like a, a senior instructor under, under the Healing Tao. And it was, again, it was the basic stuff. We did like microcosmic orbit, fusion of the five elements and, and some iron shirt Qigong. And it was very cool. It was very, uh, very heavily based on visualization, which was an, another aspect that we hadn't branched into too much, but at that point, it, it really went further into that. Um, and I find that very interesting as well to add the breath control, the mind focus, but also the visualization. Um, so I, I, that was that was the next sort of segment of Qigong I got. And then 
fast forward a wee bit further about to 1993 that's when that was kind of 10 years down the line of, of starting I started teaching myself when I moved away to, to university and um, so I began teaching Tai Chi to other students and Kung Fu and some self-defense classes as well for students heavily based on Chin Na at that point and um, my my goal at university was I was studying physiology and sports science through various uh, sort of the basics of learning the martial arts got me super interested in human mechanics and why someone could hit harder than someone else but maybe not look stronger than someone else and um, so I, I studied heavily like movement mechanics during my degree uh, but also during that time because you you get <laughs> you get that kind of you meet other martial artists you're like come along to my class and check out my class so I actually had a good friend who was doing ninjutsu at the time so I went along with him and we started training ninjutsu together. Uh, and it was, it was, it was he more heavily taijutsu than ninja. Ninjutsu was, was great, but it, people hear ninjutsu and they, they flash to the eighties movies, which I, to be honest, I do myself. Um, but there was a lot of taijutsu, which was very similar to a lot of the chin na stuff and the, the grappling stuff of judo. And um, so that, that sat with me pretty well too. Um, and then as we all have to do at some point, I had to end up working for a living because I was trying to pay to keep going through university and the books alone will bankrupt you. So, and I've, I've mentioned this on a couple of groups before, I started working uh, as a doorman at a nightclub. And I've always been average height and I've always been average weight. I'm, I'm, it's, and I'm not, uh, we had a good mix of rugby players, bodybuilders and fighters so mostly I was hired on the basis of my martial art background which at that point was heavily Sing Yi based um, and <laughs> if anyone's ever wanting a trial by fire then put your name on the line and go work the door somewhere because you'll get it it's it's not always pretty it's 95% de-escalating the situation if you can through words um, but occasionally you you have to put to test what you've learned and you'll learn very quickly if it's if you didn't get it right or not and um, so I did that throughout the rest of my university career and then continued after uh, that just working purely on a, a mercenary basis to get money because my goal was to get to China and study there which in 1998 I managed to do I moved to China and studied at uh, the Beijing what was uh, the physical education university at the time. Now it's Beijing Sports University. It's the same thing. They just rebranded. Um, but it was known, as I'm sure you you know very well, it was known at the time for being where you learned from some of the best teachers. Before it became like just competition wushu based, it was still some of the best teachers were there. Um, so yeah, in 1998, I moved there. And then my my course there was specifically Daoyuan Yang Shengong, which is a medical based Qigong system. And then I really wanted to go deeper into Sing Yi. So I trained privately with uh, a Sing Yi teacher there, Li Chao Ling, who herself was from Taigu and had come from the Cha lineage of, of Sing Yi. Um, so that was, it's, it's money in the bank, but like it's what you, you know, you, you have this dream of going and you get there and it's, it's everything you wanted it to be because it was just, <laughs> it was just great training. It was, it was old school training. Um, just for example, I like at this point, that was what 1998, I'd already been studying Sing Yi for 10 years, obviously a fraction of the knowledge that the teacher had, but on day one, it was back into Santi Shu and standing. And she kept, she kept me standing for like, and there's various reasons. Obviously there's Santi is everything. Um, but I think she was just testing to see how serious I was <laughs> if I wanted to learn. So there was a lot of just standing. And I, I say this to my students now, 20, 25 minutes into just standing and, and working on that posture. And she would walk back and you'd think, oh, thank goodness, I'm, she's going to tell me to move on. And, and she would do this. She'd take your finger and go. And then walk away again. <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> So there was that level of commitment that you had to show very early on before you got any any progression. Um, 
so again, that was really what uh, what I had gone there for was the Qigong and and Sing Yi study. Um, but also at that point, I did further because it's it's everywhere. I furthered my study of Tai Chi. I really began getting into Bagua, which I'd only skirted about before that. Um, so yeah, that was that was that was the the big part of it. I I stayed there initially just at the university, living on on campus just for a, over a year initially, and then uh, moved away. But have been back several times, anywhere between a couple of weeks to three months, depending on what my my schedule will allow me to do. Um, yeah, and then after that, uh, let's see, where did we go? I ended up ended up in Los Angeles of all places after that. And um, was just out punting for work. So I'd just come back from, from China and was trying to put to practice what I'd learned. And I got in with, uh, if, if you're into the early days of the UFC, there was a dojo in Inglewood in Los Angeles called IMAC, Inglewood Martial Arts Center. And it was run and managed by Marcus, the grasshopper boss it. So Marcus fought in UFC four, five and seven, I think. So the, the early days when he was a Shurin Ryu practitioner, phenomenal skills. And this was before it was mixed martial arts. This was when a, a karate guy would go up against a, a sumo guy or a ninjutsu would go yeah. up against one of the greatest. I remember the early days of the UFC. It was crazy. Yeah. So it was, it, it, and that was a great showcase, but he had taken his, his money that he made in UFC and, and moved to a dojo. So we worked together for a little while there. Um, and he again, he was just a, a, a an, he sadly passed away a few years ago. Um, but he was a phenomenally kind person and, and really eager to spread the, the martial arts in terms of what it gives to everyone, not just the fighting aspect, but the confidence, the discipline, like all these these things that go with traditional martial arts practice. And um, so that, that was a, a nice pit stop for me. I had. And then I, I threw all caution to the wind and, and in 2000, I joined the military. Oh, um, in, 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 in the UK? Or? In the UK, yeah. So I went back to the UK and joined in, um, it was under the umbrella of military police. So it was a job I wanted to, to try and explore more. And uh, I was very interested in that aspect of it. So through that, I got to, you talk about a trial by fire by working the door. If you if you really want to do it, <laughs> then that's that's where you'll learn. Obviously, unarmed combat. You'll really learn if your techniques are anything worthwhile having when you're out on operations. Um, and I worked for for six years. I was a uh, uh, um, under the umbrella of of intelligence and security in the military. Um, most I think almost more than two thirds of my my career was on operational duty at various times and in various places so it's just it's another like aspect to it and during that time I still taught my own troops I would teach them um unarmed combat like close quarter combat and also arrest and restraint technique courses as well um I also competed for the RAF and this is another another sideline I competed for the the Royal Air Force and the inter-services so we go up against the army and the navy and the, the Royal Air Force in the martial arts arena. So there was point sparring, continual sparring, weapons and, and kata basically or forms, talu. And uh, I very quickly learned that I, it was hard to go to rules because I was grabbing a lot. And a lot of the times it wasn't grabbing. It was a lot of time it was free technique. And even if it was flowing sparring, there was no grappling and dropping and, and, and going to the ground. So I didn't fit in too well with that. I did compete in forms, um, but then after I competed, I competed in singy saber or broadsword one time, and one of the judges came up afterwards who just sat on the panel watching it and went, "That was very interesting. What was that?" Uh -huh. It's like, oh, it's like, well, it, it, it's a difficult situation because you're you want to try and represent, but there wasn't enough exposure to traditional Chinese martial arts. Even then, this was this was the early two thousands. For them to know the difference between what Singyi was versus Bagua versus Tai Chi, um, it was very much orientated towards, again, karate, maybe Taekwondo at that point. Some have Kido, so that was that was a nice side sidebar for me. Um, 
and then getting a little more recent after I finished with the military, I was at a, a loose end. So I, I went out to Japan and always wanted to go out again to, to study and, and kind of immerse myself in the culture a wee bit. And I only had the, the goal to go out maybe for a month to six weeks on a, a tourist visa. And uh, I ended up there for four years. Holy so, Dinah. Yeah. So that was, it's one of these, <laughs> these things you just end up like it, it, it suited me well at the time and, and a roll of the dice played out. And I encourage people to do this if you can. There's, there's merit to it for every aspect of your life to go through these things and see how you come out of them at the end. Um, but yeah, so I, I actually ended up working in a dojo in Japan, but teaching Tai Chi and Singi to a degree as well, but mostly Tai Chi. Um, and it was billed as Tai Chi in English. So it had a, like a double hit level because people <laughs> wanted to come and learn English and people wanted to come and learn Tai Chi. Um, and then at, at the same time, one of the other teachers in, at the dojo was an Aikido instructor, Tanaguchi Sensei. So he used to come to my Tai Chi class and I used to go to his Aikido class. Um, and it was a really, it was a really nice community there based on, on, there was some Shaolin Kung Fu there. There was some, some Tai Chi, which I did myself. There was Tanaguchi teaching uh, Aikido. There was another instructor who was a stuntman in the movies in the Japanese movie industry. And he would come and teach like stage fighting and stage combat. And uh, so it was a really cool, a cool community to, to work in. Um, so after four years there, I, I again rolled the dice and off I went and ended up in America. And <laughs> again, I've stayed, I stayed, that was in 2010, I moved over here. And then I, I did some international teaching uh, back in Europe for a wee while, but then mostly I've been in, in the States ever since. That's that's just phenomenal. It is such a nice story. And something just, just for the audience, I'd like to say is that when you're looking at martial arts teachers, it's very important that you understand a little bit about their background because what you're looking for um, in a teacher should be relative to the experience of that teacher. So if you look at, at Gary's background, for instance, if you were a person who wanted to have some way to verify the self-defense aspect of your practice, then if you train with somebody who's been a bodyguard, you train with somebody who's worked in military police and actually has a considerable amount of experience in that field, plus their traditional training background, then you're much more likely to get what you're looking for than you know, if you go to somebody who's been mainly focusing on, let's say, competing in competitive forms or something like that, with and no, no, no um shade thrown to competitive forms oh, either. No, 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 no. Yeah. There's a lot of merit in that. Um, but what you're looking for should should align with the teacher's experience. So when you when you find a teacher, you should talk to them because you can find all these wonderful things. And so I bet a lot of people are going to be looking at your website and materials after uh, after they see this interview. Um, <laughs> but we're going to just we're trying to inflate the head here. We want to make it. I know. I know. Well, that's the thing. The door. As we've said before, like I, I'm I'm all for transparency. I'm all for encouraging people to cross train. Because not every style has everything. And that's okay. Like you say, that's totally okay. And as long as you understand your limitations as equally as you understand your your aspects of positivity of, of, of a style, then I think it, it's okay. It's when you kind of start to forget one or the other, then, uh, then things get a wee bit messy. You maintain the distinction but be willing to to also take information from different places to make yourself a more well well rounded person. Definitely, definitely. And this this started early for me, even in I think it was probably the late eighties when I was training with the Kung Fu school, and one of the other teachers, uh, Jim McGee, left and he went to Thailand for three months, and he he and, and again this was him branching out at that point. He was he was a young man then, so he wanted to learn like Muay Thai and understand the comparison between what he learned as Kung Fu versus going in the ring against TIE fighters. And, uh, and, and again, it was an awakening for him to have to shift and not have all the, the tools that he had learned being able to use them and he had to adapt. So he went there for three months, had a few fights, a few amateur fights, and then came back. And the first thing that a few of us did, not all of us, but the first thing the few of us did was like, teach me this as well, because 
there was there was now a new aspect to to learn um and it, i think it's important to understand if that's your goal if it's not it's completely fine and this is where it gets it gets murky when people say oh tai chi is not just a form for health and it's not but for some people that's all it is and that's all it should be um and that's perfectly okay you just have to 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 have an understanding of what it is that you want out of it and like you say ask the questions it's uh, my mom always told me i've got a good scots tongue in my head so <laughs> you use your use your use your voices and ask the questions and do the research always um and and see for yourself what what it is that you want to learn and where you can actually find that so you know it's really funny because where where i live um the the majority of people are um we're, we're initially from from Scottish families, right? And I know so, I have family very close to you. Oh, have you? In in yeah. which in which which area? In Mississauga. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, that's not so far. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's not too far. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, but what we uh, the thing that's amusing to me is that a lot of my friends who come here from China, they say, "But you, okay, this is very disconcerting to me." <laughs> you guys all say hi to each other on the street and you and you bibi baba bibi baba and don't stop talking to each other and and this is crazy and why do you do it well because we uh we like each other and we, we're trying to yeah. trying to make sense of the world together you know? yeah it's, it's a great habit i feel like it i feel like somehow it's been preserved even though even though the, the local culture here is quite different obviously from from scotland yeah, I, d I think there's there's definitely some similarities. I say my my relatives that are there. It's my mum's generation, like her cousins or my grand's uh, sister's uh, family. They they moved over to to Canada, and there's a lot of and over even going back to like the the old clearances, the Highland clearances, when the 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 croft owners and the landowners were pushed out. A lot of them went to obviously Nova Scotia. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, that's what it is. It was New Scotland at the time. Um, yeah oh yeah it's true and, and if you're in Nova Scotia it's Scottish and then if you're in Newfoundland it's Irish yeah exactly yeah so I mean so. it's 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 a fantastic way and like you say the the dialogue between cultures is so important to to understand everything um there's and and you know you've traveled as well and I, I encourage people as I said earlier I encourage people to try and do it if they can even just a wee bit of traveling is is it's it literally as it says it will broaden your mind um so and and it changes your perspective on on everything, particularly from the martial arts point of view, because there's styles all over the world, some obscure, some very well known and practiced, but th they're there for a reason and they've they've survived for a reason this long. So, can, can I ask you a question about the Beijing? Uh, what it, the, it was originally called the Beijing University of Physical Culture or Physical Physical Education, Education. and now it's the Beijing Sports University, right? Correct. Yeah. So so when you were there, now it was. It was before sport wushu had its like highest moment of popularity. So I remember because in the in the eighties and nineties they had a lot of traditional teachers like Feng Zhiqiang, I think was associated with them for a while. Um, yeah. Did you ever meet Men Men Hui Feng? Meng Hui Feng was one of my teachers. Yeah. Oh no way! That's so cool. Wow. He, he was even then. He was, and this was this was again this was my goal to get there because you had the highest level of teachers for most of the styles at that point in, in the north there was also the equivalent kind of schools further south um but yeah Hmong was there and uh, I say my teacher Lee Chowling was there who is at that point was one of the lead coaches for not just the Wushu team but um she also covered some of the Sanda but also keeping the the traditional side of Sing Yi alive as well um so yeah it was just it was it was <laughs> It was one of those kid in a candy store moments when you yeah, get there, I bet. and you realize that when you wake up in the morning, your classes are actually to go train. And then you have lunch with a, with all the students. And then in the afternoon, your classes is actually to go train. Oh, that's it's, like, that's, it's like, I don't have to fit training in, in the evening for, or in the morning before I go to class. Totally so it's, cool. yeah, it was, it was a great place to go at that time. Um, now and back then, back then the other thing is you. So you really qualify as one of the great old ones, you know, <laughs> because because back then the people, you know, we we revere you guys. Uh, Jarek, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, was there at the same time? I think he Andrew was. was there. He was, uh, and um, Jarek was. He was there. 
like we both ended up in Taigu in the summer no of way. 99 okay. and never met we never met but no really we, yeah we must have been like me and you we just and we, we didn't even know that until years later oh. and we were chatting one time and uh he was he was in Taigu visiting with um like the same teachers that I was visiting with but just slightly off and it was within that that same period but yeah there was a, a few a few people back then that were either same kind of thing you went for a month or whatever and you ended up staying yeah um, and it's I say it's it's at that point it was a your dollars went a lot further, I think, than they do now. So it wasn't too much of an undertaking to just go and be like, well, this is what I'm going to do now. Because, you know, you could get a job teaching English. And get you have to be able to do a sort of gray market English teaching position. Exactly. Something like that. But then you were getting paid more for teaching an hour English than your average teacher in a school was getting paid in a, in a, in a day. Yeah. So it was, it, 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 it turned out, you know, you could make it work if you, if you could, if you could, figure out the system of it um but yeah it was it was a great a great place and again I, I, there's people that went before me and did all this and people that, that went before them that did all this you just didn't hear about them so much back then um and i think yeah, the, we have the internet now so. i know that's the thing the internet is great so you can see all that history and all the the blogs and the vlogs that people have done um, yeah. and if whether it's rightly or wrongly there wasn't you know there's not a huge amount of video footage of people back then but there are some um on vh i used to have vhs copies of people who traveled to the parks in china and and you know went to find whatever master in the south corner of the park and that was partly what drove me to to try and go and find this for myself so I remember we always used to hear these legends like because I didn't go to Shanghai until 2010 so I was a bit late but yes. um, we always used to hear these legends like you know if you go to this certain park there's a shitty yeah. Lioba guy in the corner and if you yep. try to study with him he'll beat you up because you're a foreigner. <laughs> it is 100% true the same ones and the, these were the these were the people that I was trying to seek out you know it was yeah, the yeah. That were like oh yeah if you go down under the under the weeping willow tree th there's a guy that can move you 20 feet by just like looking at you and it <laughs> sounds phenomenal um and that's another conversation but and unfortunately not once in all my searching did i ever find anyone that could do it or replicate it on me yeah, yeah. And, and i got a world of excuses for it and it was always because of me it was always because i wasn't ready for it or um i wasn't aligned correctly or in one instance and this is <laughs> This is a, a, the, the, what they, the person obviously saw because I was a Westerner um, and because my liver energy had been clouded from all the alcohol I drink, I couldn't accept his chi to move me across the, the park. And I haven't drunk a drink of alcohol in my life. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a straight <laughs> edge. So it, there was all these elaborate excuses as to why it wasn't working. Um, but again, the legends were there. Like, you know, you, you'd hear about it. You'd hear about the people that would just had phenomenal skill. And some of them did, but they were never, you know, as like Loch Ness Monster. I've looked for Nessie many times, but I've never seen her. But I'll still go looking. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, like, with the people who have skill anyway, this, is, this has been my experience, is that they have real skill. Correct. Real skill that you could, uh, you could imagine them having, having. And it's really excellent. But if you're looking for somebody to, um, you know, I impregnate your legs with their with their gen chi, um, it, it may take you a while to find it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A long time. But yeah, it is. It's, it's like you say, it's based on usually based on real skill. And that was what I was very fortunate to find. Um, I think it, it's particularly at the university and particularly with my, my Sing Yi teacher. And, and she was very open about it because one of the things I'd found, and I've discussed this before on, on some of the groups, Singyi itself is very structural based, which is great. And it's it's timing based to a degree. When you're fresh air fighting, the foot lands at the same time as the fist land, and you have this reactionary force that's coming down at the same time as the back foot cushions in. So it then comes, and it's all based on physics and, and alignment and physiology, which is great. But when you're trying to do sing yi or, or affect a, a, a strike with sing yi, just for as an example, on two or three people at once, when you've got more than just 
fresh air in front of you, it changes everything. It changes your timing because you're not in control of it anymore. Um, you're only in control of a percentage of how close that person comes to you and when they get there. So this was a limitation I'd found in particularly for, for that style and, and for most styles, to be honest, and how you overcome that. And my teacher, again, very open and honest, said, look, hey, that's not what I do now. That Like she was, you know, um, younger than I am now at that, at that point in time. But she says, no, I'm a, I'm a professor at university now. I don't go into to fighting and brawling. But basically, like paraphrasing and translating, she said, I know a guy who can. So in the summer, that's how I ended up in, in, in Taigu in the summer. She said, oh, after, cool. we, after we finish the the semester will go to my hometown and you will you can train with her master and she's she's a formal disciple of um if we go through the lineage so Choi Chai basically was the the, the Shangxi province Singyi guy and then one of his top students was um Bu Shui Quan his son Bu Bing Quan or Chuan depending on your your preference of Wade Giles or opinion was my teacher's formal master so I got to train with him and then a whole other generation above her of teachers wow. um and that was that was the what we go back to this is the reality aspect of training um these the, these teachers had been at that point where you had to defend your school when someone came challenging and latter even more so more recent to that point, but in the, the 70s, during the, the Cultural Revolution, they were the teachers that the government tried to stamp out and say there's no more martial art practice. And there's some just horrific but inspiring stories that they like had, had to tell. Um, and I've, I've mentioned this again, and I tell it in, in the teacher, uh, Jia Chan Mao, we just called him Leo Lao Sher because that was the name he used to give to the soldiers. He never gave them his real name, but he practiced Sing Yi throughout the his whole life. And this is again for for the cultural historians in in the more rural areas. There was still this this the same mandate that there was no practice of 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 martial arts and the the various other arts that they considered to they wanted to to eradicate. But in the, the rural, rural areas, the soldiers were not always given bullets for their rifles. So they would have fixed bayonets and fate, like they'd have a, maybe a magazine in, but there was nothing in it. So they would exert their authority purely by a rifle with a bayonet on the end. So Jia Chang Mao was telling me once one day, and this this in all seriousness, and this is like the stuff of legends. And he wasn't, it wasn't a bravado thing. He was, he obviously had that that post-traumatic stress of being in a violent situation, which you, you get regardless of how cool you think you're going to be about it. But he was telling us he, he had a shirt that he used to wear that had a, a small hook on it. And on the hook, he would hang his, um, like Liu Jiao Dao, so his uh, deer antler axes, one of my favorite weapons. And whenever the, the soldiers would come and they'd be aggressive with bayonets, he'd open his shirt and draw his weapons and use them to dissuade <laughs> the soldiers <laughs> against what they were trying to do. And he literally defended with his life. I mean, this could have gone wrong very quickly. And, and he wasn't the only one, but that generation of, of practitioners of Singy and I'm sure all the other arts as well, literally defended or risked their life on maintaining their practice. Um, so, yeah, I, I was very fortunate to study with reality based teachers, which is invaluable in terms of, as I say, if, if you ever think that you're going to blast someone across a room, go, go, go try it on someone who you've <laughs> never seen before, who, who works in a, a Shokan school and just see what you can do. <laughs> Well, you know, the real game, of course, is that what you do is you go to you go to Taiwan or something and you try to find a Taiji grandmaster who who has been coddled by their students to think they're really good. And then you can be the one who blasts them when they try to bless you. <laughs> and that's it. And that's, that was the olden days. Then you get all the students from the school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if I can. Uh, I don't know about that because the, there's the whole uh, there's the whole uh, lao, 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 you know, 
the old ghost uh, problem, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll do our best anyway. We're all past those times now. All we just joke about old stories. Well, that's and... it. Yeah, as I say, that was the early days. Like when I, when going way back to the eighties, when uh, Gordon set up the the kung fu school in the town, it's straight up people would walk in and challenge him. And this was like Taekwondo guys, Shokan guys. And they just throw down the challenge. And there was, I, I mentioned this before as well in one of the groups, there was Kung Fu slippers flying everywhere at that time. <laughs> you know, we just all get stuck in. And yeah, being, yeah. At that time, it was like, that was, there was phases of let's train barefoot. There was phases of let's train in the Kung Fu slippers. And then the Fei shoes came over and everyone was like, oh, yeah. thank goodness. I won't lose we get to keep shoes. our shoes now when we fight. I know, we get to keep our shoes. So <laughs> You think but slipping on a banana peel is bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lose your kung fu shoe. So that, there was a time and place for it. But like you say, I think everything has evolved. And as well, it should have. Because um, it's a very different world now. And assault is an assault. If, if you're going to just hit someone, you're still liable for assault. So yeah, yeah, even exactly. if you say, but I was just challenging them. It's like a court of law will not, not smile upon that defense. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think in Canada, our prime minister might have somehow gotten uh, challenge matches made legal again, so that he could have a so he could have a a, a boxing match with another politician. These guys, are, <laughs> these guys are show offs. But anyway, um, yeah, that that might be one way of solving uh, the world's problems. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Um, so, but that's one thing that people also they they often don't appreciate enough about historical kung fu culture in in. Anyway, the Anglo world, I can't speak for anywhere else in the West, but it used to be the case that you would have to defend your school against people that would come in sometimes in groups. And mm -hmm. and and people look at Count Dante, of course, as like the, the gonzo kind of like over the top, but it happened with every school. And, and it's something that where people, when they look at Kung Fu now, one of the one of the big problems is that um that really did happen right that's that's real stuff I, there, i've yeah. known plenty of people that were part of that but then at the same time now because the situation has changed probably for the better it's better that we're not punching each other randomly yeah but having said that you know you look at all the stuff people get away with now 100%. that's just bs in in social media and it, it's harder to verify the practice now and that's and you have the critics in you know some of the corners of various different arts i mean you know especially mma or whatever which by the way i, lo I love mma it's great sport um I, I will only speak positively about it but you see these critics and and they they take the most ridiculous examples of fake kung fu and it's like yeah but you don't know what what happened this is, this is real stuff we've, we've we've seen it we've been in it we've done it the i slipped on a slipper <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it it it, it, it was Again, it, and I've made this comparison before, it, it's an evolution. And as long as you acknowledge where things come, like came from originally, then I think we're all okay. Um, and it's fine if you want to have your, your very insular school where you are the top person in that school and the, the three branches that you have. And then you have a competition and you fight in that competition and then you award yourself the gold medal because you beat all your it's like I understand that it's it's very ego fed it's very human to to want to to have that that accolade um like bestowed upon you but you have to understand the bigger picture and you should and again I encourage any any of my students to ask I'm like go go train somewhere else go see for yourself if this is the style that you want but also understand the limitations of that Tai Chi isn't just form moving slowly but also, even if, if you're a phenomenal at Tai Chi, if you want to, as everyone says, put it in the, the MMA ring, e even if you go in on that, you're you're probably, even if, if you're the best, still not going to fare well because that fighter that you're going up against, that's their their job. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, also it's the other work. thing, they cross-train a lot. Exactly, yeah. It's And if, if you go up someone who's a, a professional, and, and I, I made this sort of reference to the Marquis of Queensbury who in the day was just that was the 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 standard of boxing but you put him in with Tyson even now and and it's going to be a a mess oh because yeah because everything has evolved and if you if you go blind to that evolution I think there's a problem there unless 
you acknowledge it and say that's not where I want to go with my practice and that's totally fine but you understand again going back to what I said earlier you understand your limitations of a practice or a style as equally as you understand the the good parts of it but yeah like you say the the, the old days were like kung fu in its in its generic term was a very highly revered style for its time yeah as, again as as the marcus of queensbury was he was a, like as a pugilist he was like oh this was the gold standard but again things things have, have changed broadly um and and there's always like I, I see all the time the argument of the the street versus the the ring or the the octagon whatever you want and having not and, and not gone out of my way to find it, but fighting in the street is a horrible option. So I would never encourage anyone to, to do that because very rarely are you one on one if it's if it's out and about. And if you think, well, I'll go to the ground, the concrete hmm. ground is very different when there's broken glass on it and cars driving by your head. It's very different than rolling on the mat. Um, so I just I always encourage people to understand bigger picture of what they they want to undertake in terms of of how they're going to get to where they want to go with their martial arts. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and the other thing too is like when a person starts martial arts, they have fantasies that they're going to do everything, but in the long run, you're probably going to end up in a specialized area of martial arts. And mm -hmm. so the, what we choose to express through martial arts actually really ends up being about our personalities too. And so I think part of that that maturation process for, for students is over time as they become developed that they're going to understand better what they can actually hope to achieve given their situations. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Like, I, And this is just going, like I had one student about 10 years ago showed up to class and, and he, I say student because he certainly, he, I never taught him a thing, but he walked into class mm -hmm. and uh he just he walked straight up to me and this is I encourage it as I said earlier talking to your teacher but he just walked up and said I need to learn the three most deadliest moves you know <laughs> because there's some guy that I'm going to put them on I was like then this is not for you and this again it's like it's like a movie I was like that that only happens in comics and movies surely oh, at least he didn't say I gotta go to prison in two months I know exactly but he I was like well this is not for you like I don't even know how to have a dialogue with someone who's that intent. I get it that people join if, if you know, they, they start training for various reasons, whether it's health, um, like you say, whether they have a goal to, to learn a cultural aspect and this is part of it, or if they really want it, you know, if, if the, the 80s movie reason was you got bullied, so you joined and, and trained and then took out everyone who once did you wrong. But there's... the there's got to be, like you say, that the, the word maturation, I think, is key to how you shift your your way of thinking and your focus of when you started to what it ends up being. Hopefully um, you, you go on a journey that that suits you best for it. So, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I'm the type of guy that likes to walk along next to a lake and look at birds yeah. flying in the sky. I, know, you know, the I don't think uh I don't think I'm going to the ground in the glass. If no, I, can I hope not. I hope not because, like I said earlier, it sits with you forever. And and Marcus, um, who Marcus Bossett, he said it to me straight. He said I was because I was like, Mike, this is awesome. You're like original OG UFC. I was like, what was that like? And he says, you know what? Win or lose, you go home with a sore head. <laughs> He's like, you're gonna get hit. And you got to understand that. So anyone again who anyone who's like, oh yeah, I want to get in stuck in, you got to understand you, you're going to get hit, and you've got to understand that you've got to hit someone, and and that act of violence comes with baggage. Yeah, well, there's an economics to it, right? You have a you have a cost benefit benefit analysis. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, that might that that particular type of cost benefit relationship isn't for everybody. That's for sure. Yes, yeah, and as I say, it it sits with you for a long time, and um, yeah. but yeah, it's 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 one of these things that you have to consider every, every aspect of of what you're going to undertake with that. So brilliant, you know, th this for me has been one of the more fun interviews that I've done 
So in um, in Dao We usually I, I mostly interview Qigong people and meditation. Yeah, we didn't even get onto the Qigong today. <laughs> and Taoist. Well, we, we can have you back. Well, happy to That'd come be back. Great. You want to you want to do part two? That'd be pretty cool. I, I will always do. Yeah, and then we can focus awesome. maybe on the on the Qigong because that's uh, for me that's that's kind of the bread and butter of of where things are. Um, oh, brilliant! So okay, yeah, so happy to, that, happy that's to. that's great. So we'll we'll make a date then. Um, but yeah, this has been really fun because, you know, at number one, um, I knew that you were doing a lot of this stuff, but I didn't know how how broad and how deep. And and it's very, very cool because a lot of the popular personages um, that, you know, we talk about in the community, you spent time with them. Um, you did all this stuff to, to actually verify your practice, which is really cool. You know, that's not so common. Um, and, uh, and, and the other thing is, you, you have a very positive outlook, which is, you know, I think, I hope it will be um, in, inspirational to, to people who are, you know, in the beginner level or intermediate level, and they want yeah. to keep going. Because and when people persist for a long time in, in martial arts, you want to get more and more positive and, and, uh, and use that, that skill that you have for good, which I, as far as I can tell is what you're doing. Um, <laughs> hopefully, you know, not hopefully. With, notwithstanding anything I don't know about. Yeah, that, exactly. All the, all the secrets, <laughs> all the secrets. We, we did talk about that before the interview, but we do usually do a couple of questions before we close down the, the interview. Um, the first one is where do you see let me make this more specific. Usually we would say, where do you see XXX martial art going in the next yes. 10 years? The, the thing is that, you know, we talked about so much stuff. So where do you see you taking your practice and your teaching relative to where you are right now? All right. So 10 years, hopefully still going with it, obviously. Um, like my goal is to, and this is what I, I, my my teacher said, my goal for Singy in particular, and, and I was told this by more than just my teacher, but her teachers as well, was to maintain the traditional teachings of Singyi, but also keep it relevant. And that's that's the balance, because it's, again, nowadays, if you, if and, and I've seen it happen in my classes, if I have a student who's like, yeah, I really want to learn this style of Singyi, and I say, okay, well, the beginning is San T sure, and you're going to stand, and I'm going to leave you standing, they're not coming back if you even after 10 15 minutes they're like well what am i doing here because it's there's so much else out there so keeping it relevant is is the challenge and but also maintaining as i say that the teacher said you can't have it be so diluted that it becomes something different and um, so my hope is that like i can impart that broader knowledge out there that there's conditioning involved you need to train your body to be able to, if you're going to do a broadsword or a saber or a, a guandao form, you need to be able to hold the weight of that guandao and think back. If you want to go traditional, you have to think back to when it was held on a battlefield for more than a minute, 21 seconds, which is your Tao Lu time. You might have to carry it for days on end, plus fight with it for, for you know, however long that was historically. So you have to understand that there, there's conditioning involved. So I really hope that people come out the other side of this. I can move a muscle without moving a muscle thinking on the, the specifically for like the, the internal arts, as, as we call them these days, like singing in particular, um, to give that full balanced approach of, of almost evolving it to the, whenever we learn something new, is that something we can put into the practice? Um, and and will it enhance the practice? So yes, let's let's see if we can bring that in, but also find the reasoning why we're adding that in. And I think that's that's one of my main goals is to to try and impart that to the next generation. Um, there is, I think, for likes of yourself as well, someone who's learned from very good teachers. There's a responsibility to try and maintain that standard, but without as I say, letting it all go to eagle fed nonsense. <laughs> so yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see like every, every section of like 10 years or so brings new things to the, the industry or the, the, the world of martial arts. So it's going to be interesting to see. That's brilliant. I, I love it. It's very, very good. 
very it's not only a good sort of um vision of the future it's also a good sort of push in the right direction right this is what we also what we want to do at dawi is to push people in the right direction to think about these things in a way that's practical in a way that can develop so that we can have a better community so thank you for that yeah, uh, the last question is where do we find you if we, if we want to learn from you if we want to know about okay. you what's, what are the resources yeah. So at the moment, really, my main resource is uh, my YouTube channel, which is under White Orchid Kung Fu. And if you just search in and it's again, it's it's just a generic school name that I have for my school. White Orchid is not a specific style of Kung Fu or martial arts, per se. It's it's the business name. Um, and I know there's even up to recently, there's some confusion sometimes when people see the name of a school and they attribute it to an actual style. Um, so, yeah, it's just it's basically that's at the moment i had a, a a nice website up and running i think i mentioned it to you before um it was completely like the 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 host thing i wasn't entirely happy with so i've just i've taken it off of of that host at the moment and i still have the site which i may put back up but mostly through youtube you'll find a lot of singing resources and then we'll talk about this if, if we do part two which would be phenomenal uh, a lot of qigong resources on there as well a lot of qigong and one of the reasons that i i really focused on that was during as we all suffered during covid everything went like the places the schools i was teaching at shut down i still had one or two private students but even that was moved to online at that time and i think at that point in my mind the world just needed a little something out there that perhaps they could try if they were stuck in um, so I put, I ended up putting a lot of Qigong content on there, just free, and, and some of it's instructional, some of it is like a sort of primer, if you will, so that it gets you started, and then maybe if you want to learn more, then you seek out your teacher um, or, or get more involved with myself, either online or in person. Um, but yeah, at the moment, uh, YouTube is good, and then on Facebook, I'm active on a, a lot of the groups, and as I said at the beginning, I'm always happy to debate a point, like always. <laughs> it, it may not be what you want to hear and you may not say what I want to hear and I may not believe you and you may not believe me, but the 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 healthy conversation is how I think we, we evolve. So I'm active on Facebook quite often. And so, yeah, that's that's where you can you can find me. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So there you have it, everybody. Um, Gary Bickett. And you can find him at White Orchid, White Orchid Kung Fu, Kung Fu yeah, at, on Kung YouTube. Fu. Yeah, we're gonna put the link in the video description, so you'll be able to check it out. Um, other than that, any last thoughts? Uh, no, it's been a pleasure, mate. It was it was a long time coming this chat with you. So <laughs> marvelous. Yeah. Can can you stick around for a sec after I finish the recording? Yeah, of course, of course. All right. Well, everybody, this has been the Dawi Expert Series podcast. Uh, Robert Coons. Um, I hope that you had a, a good time watching this and you will go find uh, Gary and his his exceptional breadth and depth of, of knowledge because it's it's really out of this world. Mm -hmm.